the authors of our book take a pretty unique approach to the topic of compactness, so what it means for a set to be compact. Um, but I will say that what do you suppose that most students from real analysis remember about what it means to be a compact set of everything that's listed up here on the screen? Closed and bounded, whoops, didn't want to cross it out, wanted to highlight it. Closed and bounded is the characterization of compact sets that people tend to remember um, because it uses these two words that we already have a good feel for what they mean, right? We know what it means for a set to be closed, which is that it contains all its accumulation points. So every accumulation point of the set belongs to the set. Um, and we also know what it means for a set to be bounded, right? That it's a subset of some finite interval of real numbers, right? There's an upper bound for it, there's a lower bound for it that are finite numbers. Um, so because that's relatively easy to understand, this is what most people remember about compact sets. Um, so then the question is, why are they interesting? Right? Why would we care about sets that are closed and bounded in ways that we wouldn't care about sets that are just closed or sets that are just bounded, but maybe are only one and not the other, or maybe neither? Um, and so it's these other properties that give it its power. Um, and in the, in the text, uh, they talk about this example of how compact sets are used to make arguments from what are called local to global. In other words, we have a property of something in analysis that might hold at each individual point of something. And we want to know whether that property holds on an entire set of points. Uh, and those arguments often fail on sets that are not closed or sets that are not bounded. Uh, and so the purpose of this is to kind of get a feel for, for why that happens. So the two properties, and they both take a little bit of mental gymnastics to wrap your head around, and that's the point of today's activity. Uh, but the two properties are called the bolzano weierstrass property and the heine borel property. So yet again, we have four mathematicians with difficult to pronounce names um, lending their, their, their names to uh, these properties. Um, and Bolzano Weierstrass we've heard about before. Uh, what else do we know in our course that has Bolzano and Weierstrass's names attached to it? So the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem says that every bounded sequence, every bounded, and I'm going to use BDD to abbreviate that, every bounded <coughs> sequence has a convergent subsequence, right. And so as you might expect, there's a relationship between the bolzano weierstrass theorem about sequences and the bolzano weierstrass property about sets, right? The bolzano weierstrass property for a set says that a set has the bolzano weierstrass property if every sequence of points in that set has a convergent subsequence whose limit is in that set. In other words, it's saying that we can't have a sequence of points within our set without also having a subsequential limit of that sequence inside our set. So we need, the su we, need the, we, need the, we need there to be a convergent subsequence in the first place, and we need the limit of that convergent subsequence to be a point of our set. And that has to happen for every sequence of points inside my set. That's the bolzano weierstrass property. Um, and so you can kind of maybe hear the echoes of the bolzano weierstrass theorem in this, right? We need there to be a convergent subsequence, and we'll know that that happens if we know that our sequence is bounded, according to the bolzano weierstrass theorem. And we also need the limit of that convergent subsequence to be a point of E, which means that it needs to be a limit point of E, which means that E needs to contain its limit points, and so E needs to be closed. Right? So the, the echoes of closeness and boundedness are there, uh, just in thinking about what that property is. The heine borel property is the one that takes a lot more noodling, in my experience. Um, and I'll say that there are some authors of analysis textbooks that use the heine borel property as the main event in discussing compactness. Um, but this one's kind of a challenge. Uh, so what I'd like to actually do is jump forward into the group assignment uh, and just talk about, kind of get you set up to think about the heine borel property by thinking about the example from the group assignment. But let's read the definition once through first. So a set has the heine borel property. If any time I have a whole collection of open sets, so this could be countably infinitely many open sets. It could be uncountably many infinitely many open sets, right? So it's just some big giant bucket of open sets. And if that bucket of open sets has the property that E is a subset of their union, so my big bucket of open sets, I un union them all together, and E is a subset of it. So very often, this is called an open cover which is kind of a nice uh, evocative language, right? An open cover of E. Uh, 
and a set, the set E has the heine borel property, if any open cover of E, so any bucket of open sets whose union uh, uh, covers all of E, has a finite subcollection that also covers E. That finite subcollection is often called a finite subcover. Finite open subcover. So this is weird. Um, let's look at an example uh, motivated by the, the group assignment. So let's take an example. I don't want to directly take one from the group assignment because I want you to think about those. Um, but let's think about, I don't know, the open interval from 0 to 2. So let's think about that as my set. I'm going to diagram it out here. So my open interval, 0 on the left, 2 on the right, and I'm going to shade in between. So, whoops, here's my set. I'll call that E, 0 to 2. So what the heine borel property would say is that if I have some way of covering this set with, uh, with infinitely many uh, open sets, possibly infinitely many open sets, then if the heine borel property is, is, is true about E, then I don't need infinitely many of those sets to cover E. So another way to think about it is the heine borel property is satisfied if we are never required to use infinitely many open sets to cover our set. If it's always possible from within an infinite collection to choose only finitely many of them, that works. So let's think about this as our cover. I'm going to take as my first set, U1. Uh, let me make that first set the set from 1 half to 3 halves. 1 half to 3 halves. That's the first set of my collection. Uh, and then for my next set in the collection, uh, I'm going to nudge it out a little bit. So that maybe now I'm going from 1 over 4 to 7 over 4. So that's U2. And then U3. I'm going to nudge it out just a little bit more. I'm going to go on the powers of 2. So maybe this next one is 1 eighth out to uh, 15 eighths. And so on and so on and so on. So that the nth in my sequence is 1 over 2 to the n comma, 2 minus 1 over 2 to the n. So that's the pattern of the open sets in my open cover for E. So why is it true that E is a subset of the union of all these open intervals? Now is when some of the skills that we developed very early in the semester are going to start to come in handy, because now here I have this giant union of all these open intervals, why is it true that E is a subset of the union of all of these? So these are actually nested intervals. Each one of them is a subset of the next one. Right? So if I take the union up to a certain level, n, then the union is just going to equal the nth set, right? because they're all included in one another. And as n tends to infinity, what happens to 1 over 2 to the n? It tends towards 0. And 2 minus 1 over 2 to the n? Tends toward 2. So it's true that any element of E that I pick is eventually going to be in one of these sets. Okay. Uh, so it's true that this is an open cover of E. But then why is it also true that no finite subcover, no finite subcollection, covers all of E? How do we know that we can't get away with covering E with only finitely many of these sets? Suppose that I have a finite subcollection, um, un1, un2, up to u sub n uh, j, or something like that. So I have only finitely many of the sets in my collection. I'm going to think about just that finite subcollection. If I take their union, then as Matt was noticing, the union of all of these, because they're nested within one another, the union of finitely many of them is just going to be equal to whatever was the largest 
uh, index of all these sets. Let's call that u sub n m, where n m is the max of all these indices, n1 up through nj. Right? And so the union of any finite subcollection is just going to equal one of my open intervals. But no matter which one of my open intervals it is, its left-hand endpoint is going to have a little bit of daylight between it and 0. And the right-hand endpoint is going to have a little daylight between it and 2. Right? And therefore, there's always going to be some point in E that's not going to be a subset of this union. So that's the heine borel property in action. For this particular set, E, right, we have exhibited an open cover, a, co a collection of infinitely many open sets, such that E is a subset of the union, which also has the property that if I take any finite collection of those and union them together, I'm not going to cover all of E. And as Sophia points out, the reason that we got dinged here is because E was an open set. You might imagine, especially based on the theorem that we have in this section, that if we had used the closed interval from 0 to 2, we wouldn't have been able to do this. And so your task on the group assignment is to show for one of these two sets and for one of these two properties explicitly why that set doesn't satisfy the property that you chose. <laughs>